Hello and welcome to this edition of Chuck's Culture Channel. And this time around, I'm talking with conductor Nick McGeegan. Described by the New Yorker as an expert in 18th century style, and by me as a man who clearly loves what he is doing and communicates that affection to the audience, McGeegan will be appearing with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra March 10th and 11th, 2023, in a program of rarely heard music by Mendelssohn and Beethoven. We'll be talking about that and about some of the other projects he has on the boil right now. But first, to give you an example of that joy I just mentioned, here's Nick McGeegan conducting the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and Chorus in For Unto Us a Child is Born from Handel's Messiah. <laughs> McGeegan conducting Handel's For Unto Us a Child is Born from the Messiah, at least the first minute or so. And now here he is, live via Zoom, uh, from California. So Nick McGeegan, welcome back to Chuck's Culture Channel. Very nice to be here. It's nice to see a picture of Powell Hall behind you. And yes. here I am in uh, my office in Berkeley. Yeah, so there you are. Um, I didn't know you had an office in Berkeley, but that's cool. That's where I live. So, oh, what is it? I didn't know that. No, no, it's the accent is deceiving. I live in California. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we know you're not from America originally. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid it's rather obvious, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> first place I came to in America, though, for any length of time was St. Louis. So, it, that really? feels oh, yeah, I was teaching at Washington U from, from 79 to 85. So, that's right. Six years, basically, um, was my. Uh, introduction to living in the u.s and i couldn't imagine a nicer place to be oh well thank you that, you know that's right i had totally forgotten that that was true so i guess i'm getting old but <laughs> <laughs> anyway you, you're going to be here in st louis conducting the st louis symphony orchestra and you're doing a program of two works uh, inspired by goethe so tell us about it well indeed goethe is the link um goethe met both composers uh, and so it's it's a personal link between all among all of them uh, it must be said that goethe really adored mendelssohn he thought he was the most wonderful mm. guy um mendelssohn of course being the urbane sophisticated um person master of many languages mm -hmm. courtly manners everything appealed to goethe greatly uh, goethe and beethoven did not get on. Uh, should we just say that Beethoven's social skills were were lacking yes, in well, so many respects? And of course, that's not helped by the fact that he couldn't hear what people were saying. But uh, yeah. he didn't kowtow to aristocrats. He didn't uh, bow and scrape as he should, uh, and as Goethe felt that he should. They actually met in 1812 in a spa town called Teplitze, which is just south of Dresden. It's quite a long way for for uh, Beethoven to travel, mm -hmm. and, but Beethoven had actually written the uh, incidental music to Egmont in 1810, so that was two years before uh, they actually met at this spa town, and uh, Beethoven found uh, Goethe too much of a, a, a too much of a sort of 
uh, toady as far as the aristocrats and the grandees. Mm. So too courtly for his taste. And um, and uh, I think Goethe just found Beethoven rough and bluff and well, <laughs> and a bit, should we say, a little bit feral. <laughs> uh, I, th I think Goethe was not alone in that, as I recall. Uh, no, no. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think he was... Uh, I think Beethoven must have been quite tough to get on with. Yeah. Uh, not, but it's not always his fault. He had definitely a a, a strong, shall we say, um, idea of how society should behave, mm. which is not the same as how society behaved. <laughs> Even yes, he, after he was, the French he, Revolution. <laughs> well, he was strongly Republican with a small R, yes. Yes, with a very small R. And... Uh, Obviously, he lived in in the in the Viennese circles, which has an emperor and everything. And he knew a lot of aristocrats who paid the bills for him, after all. Mm -hmm. But he didn't see why that he should bow and scrape and kiss their hands every two minutes and tell them how wonderful they were. So, I mean, it's somewhat ironic because, of course, what drew Beethoven to uh, Egmont to begin with was the uh, the anti-authoritarian sentiments expressed in it. Absolutely. I mean, it's all about uh, freedom and brotherhood and founding of a new nation, getting rid of the uh, shackles of uh, of being in thrall to another nation. All mm -hmm. that sort of thing very much appealed to Beethoven. It's it's what appealed to him in the original sentiments of the French Revolution. Although, of course, once Napoleon came along, uh, he immediately saw that uh, Napoleon was breaking all the rules and. Yeah. cutting the name out of the Eroica Symphony. Um, but this is this is pure patriotism, uh, and Egmont's noble aspirations are are clearly on show, and it clearly appealed to uh, Beethoven greatly. Now, most people, most concert goers probably know the Egmont Overture, because that's played fairly often, but the rest of the incidental music, the songs and uh, the orchestral pieces, I don't think I've ever heard them in a live concert before they're very rarely done i've done them three or four times now and uh, it's all top rate beethoven i mean he'd uh, he'd written six of his symphonies at that point uh mm -hmm. seventh symphony is actually 1812 which is the year that uh, he met goethe so uh, it's really right up there in the sort of vintage period of of, of middle beethoven um funny enough some people do know at least the end of the incidental music because it's the bit, it's the happy bit that's tacked onto the end of the overture. So there, there are some few little bits that use the songs are lovely, um, and there's two of them. And then there's just these beautiful entractes, which uh, don't take, don't tell the story as such, mm. but are when they change the scenery between the different acts. So these are little. Uh, mood setters if you like and they're, they're absolutely wonderful they're sort of four or five minutes each and um, they're just magnificent uh, not not most of them aren't very heroic at all um, the heroism comes at the very end mm. and of course uh, the overture is this sort of portrait of Egmont himself um, suffering and then triumphing well you know we tend to forget of course that uh incidental music of the sort written by Beethoven and Mendelssohn and so on was uh, the precursor to, I guess, the, the film underscore music of today. But we forget that the commonly plays had a lot of music written for them as on tracks or, or underscores of scenes and that sort of thing. So it's good Absolutely. to hear that sort of thing. Every theater, whether it was doing a play or an opera, it always had an orchestra. Mm. And Beethoven's writing for a pretty big orchestra. He's got four horns and percussion and a piccolo um it's and of course we mustn't forget that as you say uh one of mendelssohn's most favorite famous pieces is the overture is the overture and incidental music to midsummer night's dream mm -hmm. uh, schubert wrote the glorious incidental music to rosamunda um mozart wrote uh, incidental music to tamas king of egypt it's it's very much um part of what a composer was expected to do um, and it wasn't thought that it was just hack work. Mm -hmm. uh, Beethoven loved doing this clearly because he did it quite often. He did it to King Stephen, another play. He and he wrote a lot of overtures for special occasions for the theatre. 
even if it had nothing to do with a particular play. One of them is actually uh, the consecration of the house. It's to, right. consecrate, it's to, it's to celebrate the building of a new theatre. So it's, he, he was tied up with the theatre, even though he only actually wrote one opera as such. He, he was involved with these incidental music projects and uh, mm. he certainly produced fantastically good music which as you say is rarely heard yeah outside well, the opening which of course is a wonderful piece speaking of rarely heard of course the other work on the program the first of all Purgesnacht by Mendelssohn is another one of those pieces that I don't think I've ever heard performed live it's not I probably not considered one of his uh one of his more well-known works it isn't though I think if you were to ask somebody who lives in Germany you ah. would say that it probably was because obviously it's a poem by Goethe, um, who is a national poet before there was a nation, if you like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Goethe is studied in schools, he's widely read, he's much loved. And uh, so this poem is, is a known one. Um, just as it would be if it had been, shall we say, Keats, I think it's Keats, St. Agnes Eve. Uh, you're not going to tell me it's Shelley, but I think mm. it's Keats. Uh, it, it's, an, it's a sort of known English poem in that sense. This is a known German poem. And it, the story, um, St. Valpurgis, St. Valpur, Valpurgis, I think is her name. She's actually British. Uh, oh. She's from Cornwall, but she she ended up in Germany as a sort of a missionary to the Goths and all those tribes who wore horns on their heads. Um, and essentially, uh, it's her eve, which is, well, her day is May the 1st. Her eve is the, the last night of April. And it ties in to, I think it's the Celtic Festival of Beltane. Which oh, is yeah, okay which is one of these things and generally it's the coming of spring and getting rid of all the baddies uh, getting rid of also the celtic demons and producing uh spring summer and all the good things that will come with that so yeah. it's a very dramatic um hobgoblin type of piece which of course appeals very much to mendelssohn who had a great way of with the supernatural we just have to think of his fairy music in midsummer night's dream although these ones are much more malicious hmm. uh, and uh it's uh it's an absolutely wonderful piece we are actually doing it in english rather than german because when Mendelssohn published all his major choral works the choral works in german that's to say elias which we know as elijah mm -hmm. uh, lobgesang the hymn of the the hymn of praise these were all published bilingually by Mendelssohn and he actually often worked with the translator to make sure that the English version was good he had an English someone who would translate for him although his English was extremely good wow. and he would make comments in letters in English to the uh, uh, to the translators because England and particularly London uh, was the the biggest market that a European composer could have. I mean, yeah. Germany hardly existed at this point. It was different kingdoms. Uh, Great Britain was one place and it had the Industrial Revolution, it had money and it had larger concert halls than other places. So it was no surprise really that he, he wanted to do the premiere of Elijah in Birmingham. He did these other pieces in London and around the country. He loved coming to England, partly because mm -hmm. he got on so well with Queen Victoria. Uh, um, although that was a little bit of a an embarrassment because Queen Victoria wanted to sing a song of his with Mendelssohn himself accompanying, which he readily agreed to do, but had to confess that actually he hadn't written the song. His sister had, and it had been published under his name. <laughs> the, <laughs> So it's one of Fanny's, in fact. All right. Yes, as a red-faced Mendelssohn in front of Queen Victoria. Uh, one thing that's typical about uh, the first Valpurgis Night is that uh, it's one of those pieces that Mendelssohn wrote and rewrote. Uh, it dates, I think, from 1831, but a dec well over a decade, 12 years later, he revised it, and that's the published version that we now use. Okay. Uh, I could go on at no great length because I don't know much about it uh, of all the um, little differences, but Mendelssohn revised almost every single piece that he ever wrote. 
at some point. He was a constant tinkerer. Uh, and uh, I happen to think this is a wonderful piece. I'm thrilled to be able to do it. And I think it's nice to have the link between mm. the, two, the two pieces. So they, uh, as I say, all three people, all three men knew each other um, for better or for worse. Uh, Goethe is the, the kingpin here. And so they fit together very nicely. And I think it's great to have a piece of Beethoven, which is, well, a piece of Beethoven and a piece of Mendelssohn, which are much less well known than, say, the symphonies of Beethoven. Certainly, it's nice to hear the rest of the incidental music. And it's great also to have the um, a work by Mendelssohn, which is everybody agreed was a wonderful piece. Even the people who were a bit snooty about Mendelssohn, like Berlioz and people, all thought this was a masterpiece. Well, and it's it's an evening of music for the, or very, I was going to say music for the theater, but very theatrical music as well. So you have that tying it together also. Totally. And it's also wonderful, um, since I haven't worked with the St. Louis Symphony Chorus since before before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. you, uh, in fact, just before the pandemic, I think I was doing Haydn's Creation in 2000, the fall of 2019. So it's great to be back with them just over three years later uh, to do this wonderful, wonderful piece of Mendelssohn. It's a really good sing for the choir. Um, yeah, it's going to be tremendous fun. It's very high energy music for the Mendelssohn. Uh, as somebody pointed out, uh, this was Mendelssohn lives in the era before decaf. <laughs> so that's what's coming up uh, in uh, March of this year at the St. Louis Symphony. But of course, you perform all over the world. So I wonder if you could tell me what other um, what other projects you've got coming up after your visit here in St. Louis. Uh, well. That's the week I get, I come flying back on the Sunday, uh, March 13, and I go almost immediately into performing and recording Bach's B minor mass. Oh, my goodness. And funny enough, Thomas Cooley, who's singing the tenor part in the Mendelssohn, will be also in the Bach. So uh, he's a terrific tenor and a great friend. So it'd be lovely to be working with him for a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, it's already been a very busy year. I've been to Europe twice. Mm -hmm. um, travel doesn't get any nicer. It seems to get longer. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I just was doing a bunch of Vivaldi and Bach's Magnificat, which is a piece I just love to do. Very different from Balbogis now because it's joy from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. uh, and funny enough, in Scotland, they do Messiah at New Year's. It's a kind of hangover. Oh. So... I had no messiahs this year until January the 2nd in Scotland, which is, it was all Christmas oratorios, which has suited me just fine. Yeah. Then, of course, the uh, Messiah was originally written for Easter, so. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have an Easter one this year, but V minor mass is the one because it's it's the day before Bach's birthday, which is okay. very nice. And then uh, later in the spring, I'm going to Sweden to record the Mozart horn concertos. Oh, who's your soloist? Uh, Alex, Alex Gimmel, who's the, he's Scottish or English actually, but uh, he's the principal horn of, I think, of the Gothenburg Symphony. And I've, okay. we've already recorded stuff together with the Swedish Chamber Orchestra. So it's a, it's a great joy to be coming to do that. And then over the summer, I've got my usual blossoms and blossoms and bowls, <laughs> Hollywood Bowl, at oh. Cleveland Orchestra at Blossom, uh, okay. Aspen all that stuff, which is uh, it is how I spend my summer going around summer festivals. Uh, it's always terrific fun. I just love it. Very good. Uh, Very good. Uh, well, Nick McGeegan, uh, once again, thanks for taking some time to talk to me. Um, before, you know, before we uh, conclude the interview, are, is there anything you want to bring up that I have neglected to mention? Because this is a chance. I don't think so. Uh, this is a it's always a treat for me to come back to St. Louis. I first conducted the symphony in a Powell Hall concert in December of 1986. Wow. So that's that's a while ago, shall we say? Yes. <laughs> 30 something years, over 30 years. Uh it was it was uh Handel's Messiah with Lorraine Hunt Lieberson singing soprano in Oh my days. goodness. It was an all-star cast and uh it was just lovely to to do that. One thing I think it's very interesting is that, um, of course, my dear friend Amy Kaiser has stepped mm -hmm. back from yes. uh, 
directing the chorus. So this is the year when everybody's looking for that the symphony is looking for somebody to take over. So I, I, I wish all those candidates all the best. I'm going to get to work with one of them for this. So that's mm -hmm. going to be great fun. And I hope to see, of course, I have to see Amy when I'm there because she's one of my best friends. And uh, it's always lovely to come back. And I'm not only coming back to um, do the symphony, I'm also going to play some chamber music uh, earlier in the oh. week. Um, at, I think it's at Sheldon. So that will be lovely. Okay. With that's the chamber what... music society. Yeah, it's uh, the chamber music I... society of St. Louis. Okay. Yes, I that. often do. So I'm coming in a day or two early just to uh, do some have some fun with my pals in the St. Louis Symphony. It's lovely to sit down and play chamber music with them. So yeah. always into that. Yeah, well, I'll have a link to that in the uh, video description box also. So that's terrific. Great. Well, again, uh, Nick, thanks so much for taking some time to talk to me. Um, happy to see you back in St. Louis again. Uh, I am, as you know, as I have said before, a great fan of your work here. Yeah, and, very kind. Uh, I, I, I just love the joy that you have uh, when you get up there and start conducting. I mean, it, re it really is infectious. Well, I hope so. I mean, the... it's the good kind of infection. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I've done Egmont, oh, as I say, three or four times. It's always a, a joy. Actually, funny enough, Valpurgis Nacht is a treat for me because it's one of the ones I haven't done before. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's always nice, you know, at my advanced age, it's always nice to uh, come. I've done so much of the repertoire over and over again, which is good because maybe I've got something interesting to say about it, but it's always nice occasionally just to have something new. And that's yeah. uh, especially by a great composer as well, one of whom I adore. Well, again, thank you so much. And My pleasure. Uh, uh, listen, uh, all you out there watching this, spread the word. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Tell folks about Chuck's Culture Channel on the socials and anti-socials and everywhere else. And stay tuned for, uh, for more interviews in the future. Once again, Nick McGeegan, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. All the best.